excellent talk. I thought covered such a wide variety of issues. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions from the, from the audience. So we do have some minutes available. If you straight away, yes, please. Hello. You said you were going to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be as difficult as I can be. First of all, it's lovely to hear your talk. I really appreciate it, and I'm so pleased that you appear to be a human being. <laughs> London. Did you notice how the person who works with me laughed loudest? I'm from London. I've had yeah. dealings with the Metropolitan Police, and they have a very different attitude to the one that you're displaying this yeah. evening. So I'm grateful for yeah. that. But the Met have a different challenge, don't they? So, don't, don't stick up for them. We don't like them. No, so. no, I, 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 <laughs> the Met, you know, in policing, the Met are the force that we all sort of, you know, we have a bit of a teasing relationship with. They play really high stakes yeah. with a really transient population mm. um, and they play it in a world that is more overtly political. And we here police an area which probably, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not, not going to ask this, probably all of us in this room live or work or bring up our kids or we do stuff in Leicestershire. Mm. So we've kind of all got a stake in the same place. The Met find themselves in a different place to that because their cops can't afford to live in London. Yeah. So you get that thing where they've tried to recruit from the place uh, to try and force that to happen. Um, and the, the Met, it's just, it's edgier and in a way harder there. It's just a different kind of place really. Well, my personal opinion is that I don't like them, and uh, they are I on didn't my, say I like them They're on my list, they're on my list. If you There's play a camera going, sports, I can't say. Yeah. If you play them in sports, make sure you give them a good hide-in. <laughs> my question, my question is this. Alright, so since one in three of us in the UK are, uh, have used illicit substances at mm. some point in our lives, mm. I wondered, what is your opinion if drugs were decriminalised and prostitution was oh. decriminalised and regulated, how do you think that that would affect the Leicestershire police force? Right. Nice easy question. Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice, it's a nice <laughs> easy question. Has the BBC gone? I was going to say, has the BBC gone? Have they gone? Um, I'm not completely persuaded by the legalising drugs bit, but I'm also not completely persuaded by how we deal with it. I mean, now we have changed what we do. We do lots more community remedy. Friday, Saturday nights, we do all that stuff in the city where you know if we lock people up with Class A and it's not a dealer amount, then we put in them into a community remedy. We refer them to for some sort of help and support, and health advice, rather than. I think the problem is that in a world, if you finish up in a world where it, drugs are legal here, but they're not necessarily in other places, what are the consequences of that? And I also think my other concern is that I, I think. The damage that some, I mean, cannabis, when I was a young PC, I could kind of see that the 80s version of cannabis was probably not as strong as the 2017 version, and I kind of worry about the health bit. Yeah, but yeah and I worry about the health bit. The prostitution bit is really, um, uh, I don't know, but I, I wouldn't, I'd say, who knows where the local, pro <laughs> no. Um, I it's do. not far from here. I do. Uh, there's, you know, we try and work with the girls who we see as victims quite often. They're quite often in a version of slavery. I mean, modern slavery has become very in vogue. They're doing what they do out of fear, a bleak necessity about no other options. Um, the legislation isn't the easiest legislation to enforce. But I'm just, on a personal level, I'm just uneasy at the concept of a kind of regulated brothel market, which sort of sounds like a late night Channel 5 series don't, or something. Don't sort. the police go to other countries and see where like prostitution is yeah. deregulated and yeah. the girls are looked after, they pay tax and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And why don't you go over there, see what they're doing, steal all their good ideas and bring them back yeah. to Britain? Of course. I mean, that's exactly what happened. I mean, there's a bit of me which would say it's not for me to shape the legislation, is it? It's for me to deliver enforcement of the legislation. Um, Next time you're, in a, you're okay. in a meeting with the Prime Minister, can you tell no, her I don't get that, that I'm coming to <laughs> 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 I, I mean, I think, just very quickly, just behind, behind your question, though, I mean, th those kind of discussions do need having. Because as we currently are, there's a kind of vicious cycle which isn't always a constructive one. Mm. But I'm afraid I'm a bit cynical now about, I don't think there's an easy option to anything. You know, okay. and I put those into that. Question just Simon. Hi, Rashlin. 
Hello. Uh, you have been here in Vesta for the last nearly six six years. Seven. Seven. <laughs> Seven. Sorry. Are you going to concede you were part of the panel that appointed me? I, 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 I'm not going to repeat that question. <laughs> Sir, could you tell us, in a very nutshell, what you have achieved during the seven years in, <laughs> in terms of equality and diversity and mm. multicultural and multi faith and Gosh. other bit of it, racial equality? So, so there's so part, look, Russia, uh, part of the process to be chief here, just so people know, was um, a panel of about, well, a panel, it was a, a room of about 50 people, wasn't it, from different communities, local councils. You asked the first question, you asked. What would I do if you if you and I disagreed about things and how would we deal with disagreeing? Yeah, I feel offended. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, in a way, it's not for me to say what I have achieved or you know. I mean, firstly, I haven't achieved it. I've got a team that have achieved it. I hope in relation to diversity. I mean, some of those awards, in a way, they're kind of baubles, mm. uh, but in a way, they're indicative of an approach that we've had. I hope we've been open to working with other communities. I'm always very touched. Things like some of the faith forums, quite often I'm the only person there who isn't a faith leader, and I always find that quite touching and thought-provoking, because we're perceived as being part of sorting those kind of issues out. Um, I hope I've made the organisation a bit more at ease with it. I want people who are at ease with themselves, because if they're at ease with themselves, then they will be able to work better. And in a world where I've got 547 fewer cops, I need people to deliver all the time. Um, I'd love to have achieved more around recruiting, but you know, all this stuff we do as, we do as a team, really. Um, so I think we've done a lot. Uh, I'm told I've changed, you know, a bit of feedback I get from people is that I've changed the tone of the organisation by maybe being a bit human, but I've been supported by great people. There's a couple of them in the room who've done shed loads of work because to get Stonewall recognition in that level, there's been lots of work done. Mm -hmm. To be quality assured by people, you know, the stop and search work, you know, my start point is, whoops, we can't carry on like this. But the end point we've reached has been because of hard work of other people. And, um, so, but it's for others to say, isn't it? It's for others to say. Okay, question here. Yeah. Um, so my question is around the referral and how you work with other agencies. So you mentioned mm. a lot of what you do isn't technically always 100% policing, but it has a broader impact. Yeah. So the link with adult social services, social services, yeah, yeah. etc. How, how yeah. given the incredible constraint, yeah. how do you feel that is going to work moving forward to protect those children and to work with those yeah. vulnerable adults and hate crime. Well, I, I, I think there's a profound strategic issue, call it what you will, emerge. I mean, the city council budget in 2010 was about 210 million. I think the projection for 2020 is 70 million. Now, I've never been good at sums, but you're clearly going to be able to offer less services with 70 million than you are with 210 million, even if you've got really, really efficient and you've made your 70 million worth 100 million. Or whatever. <coughs> Population growing as well, so I think it's some real challenges. I think the other thing is that the framework in which we work is quite a risk-averse framework. And you know, you look sometimes at the media reporting of issues. Um, look, let's look at the recent terror attacks. You know, were those people or were they not referred to the what what did referred mean yeah. we're referring you know, hundreds and hundreds of people a week to other agencies we've actually been talking about today as a consequence of those referrals it seems only about 20 percent of them then need actual things doing as a consequence is that 80 percent unnecessary waste or is it a legitimate piece of information that might help in three years' time? Discuss. So I think there is a challenge, and the challenge here is that the population grows. So you can spare my ratio, I am going to do it. I used to have, well, 10 years ago, a map agger had one cop for every 430 citizens. I've now got one cop for every 599 citizens. So there's a thing there about the public. I mean, on the upside, this afternoon I spent with senior leaders from other public service organisations talking about how can we get upstream, how can we refer, and the kind of thing we've been talking about 
uh, Bronson Blues project, which people may or may not be aware of. So ourselves, fire and ambulance have all put a couple of people into a team that is working across the Bronson on a healthy, safer, stronger community piece of work. We've actually got to the point with that where some of the repeat attenders of the GP surgery, the GP's just written what I call a social prescription, which is please refer to Bronson Blues, because actually the problem is they're lonely. Yeah. They don't understand the world's move. Yeah, there's all sorts of social issues. But there's a real challenge there, which is you, know, you get what you pay for. Um, so it is a challenge. Front here. Hi. Hi. So, thanks to listen to your talk. I have an issue with uh, this, what you call Islamist ideology, because I'm a Muslim. Hmm. And I don't know about this Islamist ideology you're talking about, because no. in the 70s when we came to this country, the Irish terrorists were rampant and nobody referred to them as yeah. Christian or Protestant or Catholic terrorists. Mm. So here we have criminals at yeah. large. Yeah. And when you keep talking about it as Islamist ideology, then yeah. that in itself causes a problem because here yeah. everybody wants the same thing. We want a yeah. safe environment to live in. Yeah. We have not got yeah. that. We have a lot we have we are slaves living in fear all over the country, right? Mm. And this yeah. is something that has to be debated and addressed yeah. right. in the rightful manner because it, yeah. twice you mentioned to it okay. Islamist ideology okay. and you changed that racial, what you said earlier on. Yeah. I would like you to consider to change this also. Yeah, yeah. We move forward in a positive yeah. direction. Uh, and and yeah, absolutely, completely, that is the issue that needs discussing. Interestingly, of course, I, I deliberately chose the word Islamist rather than Islamic to indicate you know, the fact. To many we will mean one well, of the same because yeah, here absolutely. you make it harder for us so working tirelessly okay. in the community to build yeah, yeah. bridges okay. when we are confronted with this where the so mainstream what? run rampant with it okay. and makes our job harder yeah, okay. to uh -huh. build bridges okay. with the community with all the different yeah. faiths in the community. We, we seem to be doing a harder work than those who rule over us, the government. Um, firstly, I get the point you're making. I absolutely get the point you're making. What should I have described it as then? Because I consciously did not use the word Islamic. The correct me, word is criminals different. of the highest degree. Right, okay. That's what they are, the yeah, criminals. Yeah. The acid attacks. What are you going to call them, the people who are perpetrating the acid attacks? Yeah. You know, we don't okay. see that in the front pages. How many people are being yeah. acid attacked all over the country? Yeah. You know, we need to address and find that balance. Yeah. Okay. And if we keep saying so, it's so an what, Islamic problem, I, I didn't say that. Well, Islamist will be perceived as Islamic. Okay. Okay. We have a big well, problem on our hands. Ser a serious question for you then. Please help me use the right word because I I'm consciously... ready. You give me a call and I'm ready for you, Simon. Okay, well, we can sit, help. we can debate. All of us can join in together. We can okay. sort this problem out together. Because we're all one together. Yeah, all communities, all different faiths here. We yeah. can get this sorted. Yeah. But okay. if we're all in different directions, we're not going to get nothing and, sorted. And I'm absolutely Question up for, the, for that discussion. I'm ready for you. Okay. Simon. Question up for Simon. Absolutely up for it. And I get the point you're making, but I just want to be really clear, that was a conscious use of a word by me, so I wasn't using the word Islamic, because that is the word that is used in those discussions. Simon, you we and I can find it. a new word. We will. And we can change. I'm up for that. I'm up for that. Let's create the change that yeah. we want to see in this world. Yeah, yeah. I'm up for that. Yeah. It worked for Gandhi, it worked for us. Of course, one of the other options which my staff officer suggested was take it out altogether because it would be contentious, but I decided that would be what we could. <laughs> so there's a question just here. Simon. There's one right at the back as well. Simon, you, Hi. See, you see how complex it becomes, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, certain words that use. You know when Lord Scarman yeah, yeah. did the inquiry into the public disorders in the 80s? Yeah. Do you think, uh, in terms of multicultural policing or multiracial policing, do you think we've actually made um, changes since Lord Scarman's uh, sort of days? Or are we really um, doing a colourblind approach to policing multicultural communities? As that gentleman says, it's very important that your prevent agenda, that you take the national lead. Mm. Even the Home Office have criticised, the Select Committee, the Home Office Select Committee, have criticised that the prevent agenda right. actually creates uh, yeah. a colourblind approach to this yeah, yeah. issue. I don't want to call it a problem. I, I, yeah. I want to call it a challenge. Yeah, You've yeah. got a challenge. Well, yeah. I gave evidence uh, yeah, to yeah. the Home Affairs State Commission. But is the, is the Prevent Agenda nationally working? I don't. I personally don't think it is, and I think okay. people from our communities yeah, yeah. and other communities feel that it's a colourblind well, approach. And then, to some extent, what happened recently, yeah. where six of your officers 
that, that, that were heard recently. Yeah. Lucky it wasn't anything serious, but that got out of hand because I think it was badly managed by your officers. Earlier yeah. on in the day, intelligence led. Information yeah. was coming through that things are going to be happening. Yeah. But if um, you'd not been at the cricket match and you probably were sort of in gold command, you might have been able to say to your officers, let's get the, an area blocked off. So when people are coming in their cars with all these flags, right, mm -hmm. we stop them right yeah. at the beginning of, of the community and push them back to right. where they live or they come from. Yeah, that yeah. might have not created that situation. Okay. I really think that you need to reassess in terms yeah. of the, the police operation situation yeah. that is very difficult for you and yeah. I think that you, you simply yeah. change the tone of your so, organisation. So, do you mind if he answered you? No, no, because I, I came to listen yeah. to him rather than lecture. Why don't you finish up? He's having a lovely lecture. <laughs> I've taken time out to come here. <laughs> but I'm a camera, mate. Well, but can I just say, last thing. Very you, quickly, yeah. You said that you changed the tone of the organisation. Yeah. The reality is you need to change the culture of the organisation. That's mm. the way forward. Sorry. Okay, well, well, two things. Uh, I think prevent does work. It stopped 150 people from travelling to Syria last year to a war zone. Uh, we have a number of people who travel from here who are dead. They won't be coming back because of that. I don't think travelling to a war zone is a very good idea. There are hundreds of people who have not gone on to commit offences in relation to potentially terrorist offences if you've been through the prevent programme. My view is that that works. Could it work better? Of course it could. Uh, could we get better community buy-in and uh, by being transparent about it? Of course we could. Um, but it has become slightly politicised um, and that plays out. The, the dis disorder in Pakistan, uh, there's a whole load of stuff within that. I Me, mean, Firstly, I have to say I've had a number of local people say how brilliantly and bravely people dealt with it. <coughs> Isn't it really interesting that there's a million people and 1,800 police officers? I mean, the concept, yeah, how many police officers should I have in Belgrave Road just in case a load of people want to fight because India have played Pakistan at cricket and Pakistan have won? What, what's a reasonable number? Because I had half a dozen. How, how many is a reasonable number, I think, is a really interesting question. Could we have put more police into it? Of course we could, but they would have come from somewhere else, and my phone would have been ringing with people saying, why are all these coppers in vans up the Belgrave? So I, I kind of get the point you're making. I'm not sure I completely buy the second bit, because to me, I love sport. People that know me, sport is my whole life outside of the job. I am the most passionate, shouty, whatever. But I've never punched anyone because of it or thrown at anyone. Mm -hmm. To be honest, my most typical reaction would be, should we go for a beer and talk about it? Yeah. So I kind of think there's a really interesting thing about communities. If communities think it needs 30 police officers because there's a cricket match, then maybe we can do that. But I've also got the other 724 incidents to resource. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think, you know, you, but you've hit the nail on the head, which is... These things are judgment. You are the first person that said to me we got that wrong. It generally I responds. Don't mean that in a negative context, no, no, no. Simon. You're no. probably doing some good work, yeah? But sometimes no. it's colour blind. I'll give you an example. You have multicultural days where you invite uh, various different communities from those flags that maybe, yeah? But are these people so called community leaders <laughs> who have got no oh. mandate? to speak on behalf okay. of the communities, self-elected, yeah. self-appointed, got no real yeah. understanding of the issues that are happening in urban yeah. deprived areas. Yeah. They don't even live in it. Yeah. I'd like to know how many of us actually live in a terrace house that have come to here today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, look, the issue of when's a community leader, not a community leader, is, <laughs> is, is an issue that policing has been dogged with. Going back to your question about Scarman, really quickly, the organisation that he wrote about doesn't exist anymore. We're absolutely, completely transformed in what we do, how we do it, the way we do it, Scarman forced us to be more outward looking, forced consultation. I can remember going to what were known as the Scarman meetings in the olden days. But again with those, the issue was, I used to police the inner city of Birmingham. I would go to the Scarman meeting, who was there? Generalising hugely, white middle class people from the top end, not people from Lozelles and Hansworth where in general terms they were the bigger issues and the white people from, I'm generalising hugely and please excuse me for doing that, would be saying to me, well we don't see enough of the police. So I would say, well that's because you live you know, in a bit that's all right, you know. Um, so I kind of, but I think Scarman, Scarman couldn't write what he wrote then about now. PJ. The lady right at the back. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Um, you've already started answering the question 
my question was around prevent, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about what more can be done for people to better understand yeah. what's behind it, what's being achieved. That's it, where you got the impression people had actually read what the policy actually says, because sometimes the debate that goes on around it, I just sort of sit in bewilderment and, you know, during the run-up to the election, we you know, oh, wouldn't it be a good idea if it prevent included the extreme right wing? Well, it formally has done since 2011. You know, some people need to sack their researchers, don't they? I think the other thing is that at the community level, there is lots going on. There are lots of community discussions. Where, I mean, generally what happens during the national role is most places tell me that the local prevent are all right. They're all right, it's just the national prevent and nasty people. <laughs> And you hear quite a lot of that. I think, it, you know, but it does, you know, it, it needs to be a discussion based on what actually it is. And quite often it gets sucked into lots of other issues. You hear about Schedule 7 at airports, foreign policy, all sorts of things. The bottom line is, it's just trying to safeguard some people who are probably pretty vulnerable. The latest research, there's three mental health pilot hubs around Prevent. Uh, the cohort that's being looked at, 130 referrals, 40% of them have been diagnosed with mental Ill health issues. So you're talking about potentially Daesh and others consciously targeting people who are pretty vulnerable, which is really difficult. So this needs to be a constant dialogue around it, working with local communities. At the end of the day, it's part of the state, isn't it? And the state isn't always everyone's favourite thing. You know, the local team <coughs> are are out all the time talking, 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 talking. They're really happy to go and talk to anyone, anywhere about what they're doing, how they're doing it. They're really happy if people want to go and sit through the training. Of course, the other thing that's gone on, the Prevent Duty in 2015, extending into other agencies, you know, still two years in, there's still a training programme going on. Some of that training, it seems to me, varies in quality. I mean, my, my wife did her, she might work in a school in Leicestershire, she did her prevent training and she came back and told me what it consisted of. And I was like, oh, okay, right. And, and, you know, and we finished up discussing it over dinner, which is her curse. So I think there's a thing about just constantly communicating what it's about. And nationally, just let's put the numbers out there. Because the numbers are sort of treated by the government as, um, it should be out there. We've met before. We have met before. We've met a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. Um, two things. One, one's a question. First thing though, um, I think referring to prostitutes as girls and not just yourself. Sorry. I think that's just horrendously condescending. Yeah. Okay, I grew well, up in Highfield and yeah. there were lots of them all in every street I'm in and they were women yeah. with children were in yeah. households and okay. very, you know, so that's you're not right. yourself, it was said elsewhere. In that's well, you're right to challenge me and I didn't well, mean to be condescending, um, I'm sorry if that offended you. My, my question is, in terms of recruitment and diversity, yeah. I appreciate and hope sincerely we're a long way beyond the days of the secret policeman now. Yeah, which but, was Leicestershire. Yeah, with that in mind, yeah. my personal experience of police in, Le in Leicestershire as somebody who was doing a job in the security field is that the police were very, had a lot of camaraderie with us because we worked in a similar thing and it was about managing certain situations. But within that, it was identifiable that the minority police officers that I worked with were really quite impressed upon by the working culture of the police force and almost seemed to over-police minority groups more than the white police officers did. So when you're looking at diversity and ticking the boxes, so to speak, in terms of recruitment yeah. and getting it to look as though it's representative, yeah, yeah. how does that then interplay with the well-advanced cultures that are there that then force those black officers to kind of want to distance themselves from the black roughnecks that they might come across and therefore police them more heavy-handed and what kind of gets put in place mm. to bring that back and to encourage the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, gosh, how long you got? And um, first bit, just so people, the secret policeman was what? Ten years, what year was that? 2010, 12 years ago? It was a fly on the wall documentary where a person joined the police who was actually a journalist, went through training school and had some not nice things happen. Um, and some people got in trouble by writing. It was a Leicestershire based uh, film uh, as a consequence of which we took Basically, training schools got shut. 
and our students went to a local university in Leicester. <laughs> not, not, not this one. Uh, and that was where their training was done for probably a decade then because of that cultural thing. I think the issue about how people then behave when, you know, at the end of the day, you become an authority figure the moment you put the uniform on, whatever your role is, you are the person who, when you turn up, everyone stops and looks at you. How do you deal with that? I'm not completely, something you've said I'm not completely convinced by, which is the kind of, do we have a work culture? Of course we do. Yeah. Of course we do. But I think a lot of the things that were there in the, you know, the kind of canteen culture, all that kind of stuff, I do think has changed quite a lot. We I are... I mean, I, I'm doing a retirement speech in a couple of weeks for. Uh... Oh, are you leaving us? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Someone else has asked me to do a, a retirement speech, and I dug out some photos from 30 years ago, most of which seem to be in Steelhouse Lane Police Station Bar, as far as I could see, uh, in the middle of Birmingham. There, there aren't many photos of us out and about working. Um, because that was the culture. When you finished at 10 o'clock, you went and had a couple of pints together. You talk with your people you done policing with about policing and you did it with the group of people who you'd just been with for the last however many hours, you know. And that was the way that it was. I think that culture is disaggregated now. You know, the bars don't exist. People go home after shifts. People are not working big block shifts anymore. They're working shifts. So I think it's a cultural thing. But there is a real challenge about how people behave and what they perceive. And I sort of alluded to it there, and the, the, the Leicester University, Nottingham University study around people's experiences. As an inspector in Birmingham, I worked uh, with a, a sergeant who was a, a black sergeant. The abuse that he used to put up. Now, and, you know, and in theory, West Midlands Police had posted a black leader figure into the heart of the inner city. <coughs> ten out of ten. Wool was his life quite hard because of that. So how people then behave, how people deal with the perceptions of what they should be doing uh, within that. Some of our Asian officers, you know, some of our Asian officers cared who'd won out of India and Pakistan, but they got the uniform on, so they were stood in the middle of the road. Oh, yeah, I, I, hold, hold, and it's really interesting. Hold, hold, we hold, even took, I think I've said this to you before, um, but when the EDL came, we actually had a discussion about, is it fair to put officers who aren't white to police the EDL? Is that ethical? Is that moral? Is that provocative? Is it? And in the end, we decided people will be posted as they came. That van is going there, and whatever its demographic is, because I think that's what we've taken an oath to do. But you know, it's really what you've asked about is just so complicated because the pressures on individuals to conform or not conform, to side with somebody, are just. That, that, and that, that's the kind of thing there, it just seems that with those instances, like so because I've never been in a position where I've been being policed by somebody in that way, yeah. I think the guard kind of drops a bit and it just seems that that banter when you're having it there, you'll get Asian officers that are just like, you know what, I hate Asians man, they're doing it. And it's almost like that's as much for the group they're saying it to and not really anything to do with how they actually behave. A really, a really quick anecdote, when I joined the police, I had a tutor constable who was a Sikh. He was my tutor, so I spent 14 weeks, he taught me how to survive on the streets of Birmingham. And on day one, he gave me his three rules. And rule one was always know where you are. And rule two was always know where your radio is. And rule three was, if his name is Khan, do the bastard. <laughs> and he then threw back his head and laughed. That's what you love to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so, just as a cultural thing, I'm now, 29 years later, pretty sure he meant it as a test come joke. <laughs> but if you see me in six months, I might have changed my answer. <laughs> but I will be seeing him at the retirement due, so I'll be able to ask him. We've just got a couple of minutes left, and I know there's lots of people wanting to ask questions, so we're going to be very ask, quick. Just before I ask my very quick question, I'll come back to what this person said at the front when Simon twice said terrorism has been done from an Islamist view, and this gentleman said, Can't you use some other language? I wrote down on two occasions that Simon said it. These people are people with warped minds, full stop. Whatever side they're from, whether it's been right-wing terrorists, 
you know, other terrorists, they're all with Walkman. And I suggest that as a, as a word. Now my question is, I've got a separate thing totally. You talk about Narva Road, multi, you know, the most diverse, diverse city in the UK. This actually came true. from a spring 2016 survey from the London School of Economics. Yeah. And it was interesting, I just want your viewpoint on this, you chose a particular paper and their um, take on that survey. Yeah. Other papers, like for example The Guardian, said, wow, look at this, it's brilliant, yeah, yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to... Well, I think I've said a few times that policing Leicester is an absolute joy, you know. Yeah. There, is, there is that element of it, but what makes it a joy also makes it difficult sometimes. Yeah, because it's a, we do a people business, don't we? And people are really complicated. Well, I live and there, and I think it's a wonderful street. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Big, big point about how the press interprets some of these they things. Because they vary, don't they? Yeah. yeah, they vary. Quick question here. My question is about sex offenders. Yeah. And um, I've been reading recently that there's going to be a reduction in monitoring. Um, and um, obviously, that there are you know very great diversity issues involved. Um, but um, do you think that um, the models that you have for assessing risk <laughs> are robust enough? I mean, right. uh, uh, you know, are you sufficiently confident that you can actually um, assess the risk of uh, future yeah. offending, you know, on a panel and all of that? And um, I just wondered yeah, yeah. what your views were about yeah, yeah. that. Um, goodness me. I mean, just so people in the, in the rest of the room know, they, 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 um, over the last couple of days it's been announced that there's going to be a new tiered way of looking at risk. One of the challenges we have is the growth. I mean, I think that that data was something like there was 20,000 more sex offenders on the register. There was a bit of me couldn't help but notice there was 20,000 fewer police officers on our register as well at the same time. We've been part of the national study, actually. Um, so a new risk, risk matrix, we've been part of assessing that and looking at that. It's an academic based piece of work. I think the reoffending rate is about 2% I'm doing top of the head, two percent or something, isn't it? So 98% not. I get the fact that if you're involved in the 2% that's difficult. But one of, the, one of the challenges we have is what's the relative risk of all of those different things. So the gent over there wants more people in case cricket fans fight. Do we need to? Yeah. So it's a, all, all of what we're doing all the time is a relative risk judgment and a relative risk assessment. The model as it is is as good as it has ever been. Yes. It can always be improved. You know, it can yes. always be improved. The, 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 the matters are, found, are further compounded uh, because of the latest research on the prison-based SOTP. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's uh, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Well, there's a basic challenge for us all around recidivism, which is that the UK doesn't have a great <coughs> record on successfully intervening and preventing reoffending of all sorts. Uh, and frankly, one of the reasons that cops get a bit cynical is we deal with the same people, the same families, time after time. I did some covert authorities last week, so intrusive surveillance on a person. Uh, whilst I have been chief here, he has been convicted and gone to prison for more than a couple of years twice and he's back out and we're doing more jobs on him and I'm again doing covert authorities for him. How many times does society want us to catch this person? Because the other thing that I would say basically, and I would say wouldn't I because I'm a cop, is we're pretty good at catching these people. You know, the, the people that are going into prison, we've caught lots of times and there is a thing for society about how many. So the recidivism issue, and you started off with sex offending, and there's a thing about relative risk, and just so people are clear, there's a difference between non-contact sex offending, looking, and contact in terms of risk, but I accept all of this, and there's a victim somewhere. Yeah, even if it's just a picture, there's a picture being taken somewhere, I do get that. I'm very conscious Simon has been in front of us for a long time. There's a question here. Um, very quick, um, I won't actually ask the question I was going to ask, but I'll make one comment quickly on this. If anybody's watching the BBC tomorrow and they think the camera's going out of focus, it's not, it's Simon moving backwards and forwards. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask, Sorry. Um, that's fine. Can I just ask you to, to bring up the fact that there's a lot of people in here that are coming up with lovely comments and lovely ideas but there are lots of ways that we interact. I mean, I yeah, yeah. interact with the disability I have and do that because I've got bipolar. Yeah. Put your neck out and come in and yeah. join in them groups yeah. because the reason I say that 
the group I go to, hasn't got enough people coming to it. Yeah. But we need more people. Oh, and that goes to the point around sort of community leaders and who's a community leader and who isn't a community leader and who can come forwards. Yeah, we do try and do lots of consultation. Every neighbourhood team will be doing consultation. That might be standing in a supermarket doing a questionnaire. It might be going to the parish council on a more sort of strategic, thematic base. I mean, you're involved in the disability uh, work that we've been doing, and that's where you and I kind of know each other from over the years. Yeah, we're always looking for people who can bring the skills that they have from life into our organisation and say, you want to think about this, you want to think about that. I mean, your comments about how, what the language you're using might be part of that. Um, because we want to get better. Yeah, that, that, that's the kind of, we want to get better at what we're doing. Um, it's not hard to find us online. You can report stuff online. You can email us. If you put your postcode into our website, you can find out who your neighbourhood team is, what they're dealing with. On that, do you have an engagement strategy? Yeah, of course we do. Yeah. Uh, have you? Is it public? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's out there public, but yeah, of course we have an engagement strategy and we do absolutely shed loads. So, yeah. Every neighbourhood team will be doing. If you go, on, if you put your postcode into the website, you will see your neighbourhood team, who they are, what they're doing, where they're going to consult. Um, myself and the police and crime commissioner, we do kind of monthly go out and about, and that's deliberately quite random. Uh, so we were at Colville at Morrison's the other week, where, <laughs> where to the general amusement of my team, I was filmed. I was filmed sitting on a part of beer cans. But no overall outcomes. That's what I'm thinking. Sorry. So you might be doing some real good work around the sort of stuff that you, you, you're explaining to us. Yeah. And there's an, an organisation sometimes with <coughs> a lot of inputs and outputs, but no, over, no overall effective outcomes. Right. That's what I think sometimes it, you need to take back and say, well, do we have an effective engagement strategy? Has yeah, that yeah. engagement strategy been developed bottom top sort yeah, of yeah. thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the Police and Crime Commissioner's plan is based on an engagement strategy, what people say. Uh, is of concern to them, survey work we do, <coughs> reported crime trends, crime assessments, all sorts of things. So, yeah, there's lots we do. Okay, we're now 25 to 8, Goodness. and I think Simon's done a fantastic job. You, you put it very well, yeah, could he put his neck out? Well, I think he's done that this evening. Uh, he's been standing here for, uh, well, it must be nearly an hour and a half, not only telling us a lot about what the police force do, but answering questions on a whole range of, obviously, some quite contentious issues. So I really appreciate the fact that you've no, been to do this, Simon. Mm -hmm. And obviously we welcome everyone into the university to hear about these sorts of issues. So thank you very much indeed for coming. And keep your eyes peeled, because DICE organises all sorts of events like this. <laughs> uh, do come along whenever you can. So thank you very sure. much. Thank indeed. you.